Today is Friday, July 18th, 2014, and this is the beginning of an interview with Mr. Marvin Holman at the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center in Fremont, Ohio. Mr. Holman is 66 years old, having been born on September 14th, 1947. My name is Julie Miley, Manuscripts Assistant at the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center, and I will be conducting this interview. Mr. Holman, can you state for the record what war and branch of service in the years that you served? I was in uh, the Army from August 9th of 1967 until May of uh, 1969. I served in Vietnam um, from uh, January of uh, 9th of 67 or 68 until January 7th of 69. Okay. Uh, now when you entered the military were you drafted or did you enlist? Yes I, I was drafted. Okay. Where were you living at the time? I was living in New Regal, Ohio. Uh, on, I lived on a farm with my parents. Yeah. Um, were you in school at the time? How old were you? I was actually uh, 19. I no, 20, because when I was, to, I got a draft notice and I had a broken foot at the time, so I was deferred for just about a year till that healed up. So yeah, I was, uh, I would have been 20 when I actually uh, entered service, or 19, turned 20 after I got in basic. Okay. Do you remember the day you got that draft notice? Yeah, well, I had gotten several of them because of the deferment, but yeah, I remember getting that draft notice and, and thinking, okay, knowing it was coming, looking in the mailbox every day, knowing eventually it's going to get there. So, yeah, I do remember that. How did they run the draft at that time? What? Birth, was it by birthday or did they have like, I know they did the lottery, but what was... The lottery came after I got out of service. Okay. At that time, just as soon as you got out of high school, you registered, you had to register for the draft and pretty much everybody's got a draft notice back then unless you had a medical deferment or at first they was, if you was going to college, you would get a college deferment. But uh, I wasn't in college. I was helping my dad farm and working at a grain elevator at the time. So... Hmm. Um, uh, but some people did get deferments if they were married, uh, but then they started taking married guys after that too. So pretty much everybody was getting a draft notice. Hmm. Okay. Did you have any other siblings that were in the military or? Yes, I had an older brother, two years older than me. He went in um, after I did actually uh, because he was in college at the time. So as soon as when he graduated, why uh, he ended up going to service too? Really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, so where did you do your basic training at? Where did you go? I went in uh, August of 1967. I took my basic training in uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for eight weeks. Okay. Now, was that sort of a shock for you culture shock was it a totally different world than what you were used to totally different world because i was i grew up on a farm we were just in a small town so it was uh yeah i got a wake-up call because i had never actually spent any time away from home at all uh we were just always there we lived on a dairy farm so we milk cows uh, all the time, seven days a week. So yeah, this was quite a shock for me. I really got my eyes opened up. Um, did you enjoy it? No. No. <laughs> no. It was uh, it was a wake up call for me. Uh, the, yeah, when you were in there, they they pretty much uh, smashed you in the ground and and kept you down because they were the ones that were in control and and you were there to learn a lesson so um yeah it, yeah it wasn't fun that's for sure um after your basic where was the first place that you went after basic training uh in september i uh went from september till no it was october from october till december i went to fort sill oklahoma my AIT training was for uh, uh, artillery, so okay. I was assigned in a, uh, the, that was my MOS, I guess, was artillery. Okay. 
So I was out in Fort Sill, Oklahoma uh, from October through December. And then I came home for three weeks of leave before I went to Vietnam then. Okay. Was it always understood that you, you were going to go over to Vietnam? Pretty much so. Um, when I was in AIT, um, they came out to the field one day, we were practicing shooting, and they picked out six guys according somehow on our test uh, to go to nuclear weapons school. Really? And yes, and I was one of the six. They, and so when I went back, they took us to the rear area to fill out papers. And they said, well, you got, you'll have it made. There's no uh, nuclear weapons in Vietnam. You'll go to Germany and you'll spend your time in Germany. So I was pretty happy about that. Well, after I went home on leave, I was waiting. For, I had orders to go to Vietnam. And I said something to the battery commander. I said, well, I'm supposed to go to nuclear weapons training. And he told me, no, your orders are your orders. You're going to be in artillery in Vietnam. So I never could understand what happened to it until I got over there about a month and I got a letter from the Department of Defense uh, stating that I had a top secret military clearance and that was what the holdup was. They was waiting to get a military a top secret clearance so I could go to Germany but it was too late so I was already in Vietnam. So. I had hopes of not having to go. I was hoping to go to, to nuclear weapons training, but uh, it all fell through and we was all waiting for the clearance to come through. In the meantime, orders came for Vietnam, so that's where I went then. So all six of you that were supposed to go didn't go? As far as I know, none of the others went either. It all was just a, a matter of timing, nothing. It was just all waiting for that secret clearance to go through. And in the meantime, I find, found out that they were at home interviewing my neighbors, uh, anybody that I knew just to make sure that I could get a, a top secret clearance really? in it. And I did, I did actually get a top secret clearance, but it didn't, Never got to use it. didn't do me any good. <laughs> no, it didn't do any good. So oh. all fell through. Wow. Um, okay. Um, when you guys went over to Vietnam, did you guys go over on ship or did you go over on were you, did you guys fly over? We flew over. Uh, we left uh, Seattle, Washington, Fort Lewis. Um, I don't know it was if it was late. I can't remember when we flew, but it was an 18-hour flight. And the nice thing was we gained a day uh, because of the time difference. So uh -oh. once we got to Vietnam, we was already on day two. So we were all happy. We had two days in service already. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, we flew into Cameron Bay, which is very secure. Okay. Yeah, that I've was heard of that. pretty much where everybody flew into, or I think anyway, was Cameron Bay. Okay. Do you remember your first day you arrived there? Setting, yes. Setting foot. <laughs> What'd that feel like? Uh, it was weird. Uh, flying in, I just remember looking down. I had never flew actually till I went into service. I'd never been in a plane, so. Uh, when I flew in, uh, we were just looking down and thinking it's a beautiful looking country. It looks so pretty. And I remember the plane touching down and you just, you didn't know what to expect. You thought, are you going to have to get off the plane and run for cover because yeah. you're going to be getting shot at? You just didn't know. And all I remember <laughs> is looking out the window and seeing one of the Air Force guys driving a truck that said, follow me. And the airplane followed him to wherever they wanted us to stop. And I just remember going through my mind thinking, why couldn't I have gotten a job like that where all I could do is drive the truck that says, follow me. But I remember stepping off the plane and the incredible heat hit us. Although I think it was only in the, maybe in the 80s or 90s at that time. But I just remember leaving Fort Lewis in uh, the 9th of January was freezing cold and snow on the ground and then getting over there and getting off and just having that heat hits you you just like oh my gosh you know but uh yeah it was a scary feeling and you'd hear shooting in the background you'd hear helicopters ARAs shooting uh off in a distance and and uh and you just you just didn't know what to expect you didn't know if you had to take cover or what what you was going to have to do but I was there for like three days just processing so we didn't you know we weren't uh in any danger or anything at that okay. time <clears throat> So after you got all processed, what was your mission or 
what was your purpose when you guys went over there? Okay, our once we processed, we, we got assigned a, a unit, and I was assigned to the 1st Cab Division, and uh, they had just moved, made a move up north to the DMZ, and their base camp was in on K. So uh, once I was assigned to the, the 1st Cab Division, the 2nd and 19th Artillery, uh, our, our, our artillery's uh, purpose was to support the infantry and, and uh, follow them. We would support them as they moved through the countryside and that. And we normally would set up on mountain tops. We had a seven to eight mile range on our artillery guns, so we would s normally set up on mountain tops, fire out, and then whenever they would, if they continued moving on, then we would have to pick up and move to another mountain top so we could stay within firing range of them. And what kind of artillery did you guys use? It was a 105 howitzer. Uh, we had uh, oh, white phosphorus rounds we shot. We, had, uh, we sh would shoot flares. We would shoot what they call HE, high explosive rounds. Uh, okay. There were different fuses you could put on. So that sometimes you would put a fuse on so that when it, it was called a detonating fuse. So that when it hit the ground, it would explode at that point. You had a time fuse that you could put on so that they had it timed. You had to set the time on the fuse for like, say, 19 second, 19.7 seconds. And once, <laughs> and what that would do was as the round before it would hit the ground, it would blow up in the air. So the, instead of having it hit the ground and detonate that way, the fuse was on a time and the fuse would detonate that round. So sometimes you'd get an air burst that, at, at 20 feet in the air, uh, hmm. so it was designed so the, the shrapnel would, would spread down. Um, so you would have uh, time fuses, um, it, it was just, it just depends uh, what they wanted you to do, if they wanted it to hit the ground and explode or explode in the air. And sometimes it would shoot uh, what they call WP, uh, white phosphorus, and you'd get an air burst on that too, so it would spread out across, spread out across the ground. And uh, we had radar fuses that was designed for anti-aircraft, uh, and they would go off. They would send out a, a pulse back and forth, and they would, a lot of times would be set. Uh, that was mostly for air burst because once the pulse got so close to the ground, it would ignite the. Uh, the round and it would blow up in the air also. So, but yeah, the fire direction control would calculate how long, how many seconds from the time you shot until it would go out two mile, three mile, eight mile, uh, how many seconds it would take to get 10 feet off the ground or 20 feet off the ground. That was all calculated wow. down. Yeah, it was amazing. They would, you'd have to set your fuse for, you know, I say seven point. Whatever. Two seconds or whatever, how, how many seconds, depending on how far you shot, so, hmm. yeah. Um, I know you described before, can you describe how you guys moved? Was it we moved all by Chinook, uh, <laughs> helicopters, we would, uh, the Chinook would set down, uh, usually we were on mountain tops and there were times when we didn't have any flat surface other than what the guns would set and then our hooches, our bunkers were on the side of the mountain so there were times when the, the Chinook would set down and, and he'd have to keep his front end floating while his back end set on the ground and then the tailgate would drop down and we would all we'd be packed up and we would take our gear and walk onto the Chinook and then the Chinook would come over and we had our artillery gun and our supplies all on one strap and a guy would stand on top of the gun when they called it a donut and uh, the, the, after the crew got on, everybody got on the chopper or as many as they could take, the chopper would come over and hover over the gun and the guy would stand there and manually slap the donut onto the hook of the chopper and then the chopper would pick up and the gun would come off the ground and then as he would continue up then your supplies which was probably about a six to eight foot square um, with your rounds in it and your, your equipment and everything inside of it and uh, would pick that up and then when we would we would fly and then we would get to the next mountain top they would lower down and set the, the, the supply pallet down 
and then move over and set the gun down and then unhook the donut and then he would go over and sit down and then the back end would open up and we would get out of it then and uh, and that's how we would move and then we'd have to of course start digging in you would you would uh, oh spend all of four days you would have to dig first thing you had to do was get your gun set up get your aiming stake set up um, you would have ammo to open up so you'd be ready to shoot at any time and then we would start digging what they call a parapet and it would be about a three sandbag high wall two sandbags wide in a circle around the artillery gun and then your bunkers would be set on each side of that so that as you were firing you'd be protected somewhat and then your ammo was protected in the bunkers and your rounds you would have to open them up and and we would open them up and, and put the gunpowder at the end of them uh, it looked just like a, a rifle bullet the gunpowder in the canister with uh, seven bags of powder in it and depending on how far you shot if you was to shoot around a charge five you would take two two bags out and um, so we'd spend all our time getting the parapet dug in and then start digging your hooch and digging your hole in the ground where you were going to stay and sandbags around that and on top and um, so every move we would make and we made a lot of them uh, we would usually be four to five days of just constant digging besides shooting and open ammo and some days you'd be up from seven to ten o'clock at night just constantly filling sandbags and shooting and opening ammo so they were busy all the time and we were always up on mountain tops. Only one time did we ever get to the rear area. We were just always out in the field the whole time, uh, moving from mountain top to mountain top. So. Mm. How long of a process was it to actually get you guys packed up? Like get everything mm -hmm. up on the Chinook and everything? Yeah, it would take about a half a day. They would come really? and tell us, you know, okay, we're moving out in the morning. so. Uh, usually you would uh, have all your stuff packed. It'd be about a half a day, but you always had to keep your uh, your ammunition ready to go in case you had to shoot that night. So the last thing you did was to pack up the rest of your ammo and then get your gun ready and have that ready to move out. When we would when come time to move, it, it was probably talking. I'm going to guess two, three, four hours for your final, you know, to get the gun ready to go, mm -hmm. get it up out of the ground and and uh, get it hooked up to the slings and, and get your ammo packed up. So everything would usually be ready the night before uh, as far as your personal gear and that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then you would just, so all you had to do was just close the gun up and, and uh, get everything ready to go and get her hooked up to the gun. And, hmm. You know, but usually they'd give us a notice a day before. A lot of times they'd say, you know, the end of the week we're going to be moving out or whatever. So you, you knew what was coming. But there were a few times we got notice that, okay, we're going to move out in the morning and get ready to go, you know. So, um, so you know. Um, did you ever encounter any enemy, enemy fire? directly on you guys oh yeah all the time we we got hit once in a while when we was in Oshaw Valley we would get rifle fire because we were down in a valley um, being mostly on a mountaintop we got hit with a lot of rockets and mortars uh, a lot yeah they would um, they would they would send a lot of rockets and mortars towards us and that so yeah uh, we would we would get hit get hit a lot um, and we were lucky I never come face to face with any Viet Cong uh, being, you know, uh, the infantry were, those poor guys were the ones that were involved with that. Uh, and the infantry would pull a guard around us, so we never had to pull guard duty. The infantry would, as they would move out, uh, uh, there was always somebody around, they would set up bunkers all around the artillery and the infantry would take care of guard duty and, and keep us protected from being run upon but being up on mountaintops there are very few times that any of them would climb up the mountains and yeah. come at you so we were pretty secure okay. secure up here did you guys have any casualties in your unit actually no casualties um 
we did have several guys got hit, um, and I hadn't didn't see them after that. Um, but our battery actually did not have any casualties. We have a lot of you know hit with shrapnel yeah. and stuff like that. But I was fortunate; I had a lot of close ones, but never, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, can you describe any? I know you guys any part of the big battles that were you were a part of mm -hmm. at that time. When I got over there in January, um, the Tet Offensive started the 30th of January, and I was processing in and moving my way up north to on KR. Right before I got there, the 1st Cav Division moved up north by the DMZ. Uh, the base camp was in on K, but we moved up to Quan Tree, and um, there was. I was just moving up as a Tet Offensive was getting started, so what had happened once I got to On K, I had to do uh, three days of, about three or four days of jungle training they put us through so you'd understand they showed you punji sticks and all the things the Viet Cong did. Um, and then I finally got my orders to go to the field. Um, I went out to the field that day, uh, spend the night there. The next morning, they said we need uh, three guys from the battery to come back and help uncrate ammo. And our ammo would come two rounds in a wooden box. So at the airport in Quan Tree, uh, they would unload them off the aircraft. And then our job was to take the two rounds out and put them in nets so that when they went out to the field, um, they didn't have to uh, take them out of the boxes. All they had to do was open them up and, and so on. So I spent about probably 10 days back in Quan Tree uh, opening ammo. That was just working the ammo dump. That was what our job was. We'd get up at 7 in the morning and we'd go out and we'd usually uncrate 1,300, uh, 1,500 rounds a day. And when the Tet Offensive was going strong, why there was one day we un we unloaded uh, over 3,200 rounds. We uncrated and put them in nets. So, and they would we have orders that this net needs you know so many hundred rounds in it, and okay. this one would need. So we would put them in nets, and then uh, the choppers would come in, and once again a Chinook would come in, and they'd pick them up and take them out to the field. Um, I was all right with the ammo dump because mm -hmm. uh, I was sort of in the rear area and we would go through Quantry, the village, each day to go out to the airport. Um, and the sergeant had told me he was getting ready to leave and he said that um, in three weeks I'm going to leave and he said, I'm going to put you in charge of it. So I thought, oh, there's a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'll make rank real quick. and. So I was all set for that while our captain come back to the rear area where we were at and he said, I need my guys out to the field now. And he said, well, how about you take everything but leave home in here? And he's gone and he goes, no, I need them all. So another opportunity <laughs> fell through. So I went out to the field then and um, right after we got out there, uh, An K was a, 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 a a big uh, 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 hot spot at the time, or um, Quezon, I'm sorry, okay. went up to Anke. Quezon was a big hot spot at the time, and there were some pretty heavy battles, really heavy stuff going on. And uh, we went, we were kind of working in the area, and we heard the Marines had got pinned down. They weren't able to get any supplies in, anybody out. They were just totally surrounded and pinned down. And we knew it was a pretty big hot spot. Um, and there was a, for instance, where they came the night before and said, we're moving out in the morning. And we had, we said, well, where are we going? They said, well, we can't tell you. We, we won't know until in the morning. So we packed up at night and we flew a short distance and sat down and spend the night there, set up at night. And then the next morning they said, well, we're going to Quezon. So I was in that move, but we set up once again on a mountaintop. And, and we were able to look down and see Quezon down there and, and we shot and shot and we shot for days there till we finally got the Marines broke loose and they was able to get them out and get the supplies moved in. And uh, 
So, uh, trying to think, I think that was called Operation Pegasus, I believe. Hmm. And then we got done with Quezon and we moved around kind of a lot around Quantree and then Oshaw Valley was another hot spot going on. And um, so we moved in to Oshaw Valley. Oh, that was um, in May, about the end of May. And I remember that being a hot spot when we would move by chopper we would fly oh we didn't go treetop level but we would would be up in the air quite a ways but at that point they were everything was getting shot at so bad so we flew i don't know how many thousand feet but we were way up and with our chopper and the guns connected to it and i remember hearing bullets hit the helicopter as we were uh, coming in and you could hear rounds glancing off you could hear rounds hitting the metal it was hitting the gun below us there was you could hear it going ping ping and that but we went high and then once we got over our spot we spiraled in a spiral like that so we could come straight down and land so they they couldn't couldn't get hit so you wouldn't your chances of getting hitting getting hit were less we got three guns moved in um, and the weather got bad and they and the pilots decided they didn't want to bring any more in because of the gunfire they were taking so we sat up in the valley that night um had a chop down it wasn't it was just grassy area but uh, we sat up in there and i remember that night hearing a tank coming towards us now we never encountered tanks we were always on mountaintops and we could hear a tank coming out there so we set up most of the nights we had our guns lowered uh, waiting to shoot but it never never fired on us or never come on us for three days we couldn't get any more uh, guns any supplies in we were running out of food running out of water um, at one point the uh, infantry come running back they captured a few bags of rice and um, so we opened the rice up and we just soak it in water and then take a sea ration can and hold it over a heat tablet and warm it up that way. So we would just eat plain rice, just to have something to eat. Uh, water was getting down. We really rationed water for quite a while. Uh, finally, after about three days, why uh, the weather cleared and the infantry kind of got things settled down and we was able to get the other guns in and, and set up and uh, get everything set up in and then they could move out. Um, and while we're in Oshaw Valley, they uncovered an underground hospital, a Viet Cong hospital out there. They said it was a very elaborate hospital. Uh, we captured, uh, or we didn't, the infantry uh, captured uh, trucks um, uh, and aircraft guns, rifles. They just really uncovered a cache of a lot of stuff. Um, the choppers were still having trouble getting supplies into us because of being shot at. Mm -hmm. So um, what the Air Force did would fly C-130s over so, so we could get supplies and ammunition and that. They would fly over top and open their back end up and then pallets of ammunition and food and supplies would open up and then parachutes and they would parachute this stuff to us. So you'd see a C-130 coming pretty low and you'd see him kind of tip his back end down and then all of a sudden just a bunch of parachutes would come falling out. Some of them would land close to us, some of them weren't calculated too good, uh, but that's where the truck we captured come in handy. We could take that to go out and pick up our ammunition instead of walking because we walked we'd carry that stuff oh my gosh on our shoulders I don't know how many rounds we could get probably hundred and some pounds whatever you could get on your shoulders and then walk how far to get it back to the gun uh, one for instance and every time the planes would come in they would drop their load and then they would bank around the the mountains uh, mm -hmm. the valley the rim of the valley and they, you could just hear them getting shot at the machine gun fire would go they'd be trying to shoot them down one time there was a plane coming in um, we saw it coming and uh, we looked and we said my gosh that guy's got a hole in his wing 
and his wing had a big hole in it, his tail section, tail fin had a big hole in it, and his engines were smoking. And he dipped his load way out, he had to lighten the load up, and um, he dropped the load and he was coming down low and as he banked around again the rim of the valley you could hear shots going off and um, we saw the plane coming down okay I didn't think I'd do that but we saw the plane come down we thought oh no he's gonna crash and he just missed uh, the battery and um, all we could see was treetops and limbs flying and uh, he crashed right out in front of us and uh, we went down there and it was a ball of flames and um, we tried to see if there's anything we could do but at that time there was nothing that could be done um, he still had some ammunition inside so a lot of the rounds were blowing up and it was hard for us to try to get away from it at the time because rifle fire was flying out from all directions us the, the rounds were starting to cook off so we went back and all night long all i could hear was rounds blowing up in the fire and that um the next day another one came in and he only had two engines running at that time and uh, I think he had a hole in him too and he dropped his load and banked around but the last we saw he was still smoking but he was heading back to heading back to the, the base end so uh, yeah it was it was a pretty hotbed down back in the valley there we were there for quite a while I think that one was called Operation Delaware and um, so from there yeah we just pretty much Osha we just stayed up north and just did a lot of moving around and pretty much a Tet Offensive had kind of slowed up at that point then so um did you guys have any downtime when you were there no one, if if one time um, we would get uh, yeah if we was say we were set up um, and we would be in one spot there were times like Osha Valley uh, we were um, uh, probably there for about a month so once your parapet was dug your bunkers were dug in and and that so then it was just a matter of shooting um so there would be days that uh yeah we could uh uh you know set and write letters um uh, maybe catch up on some sleep because we would there some nights you would just shoot all night long and and uh so when you're done shooting the next job was to open up more ammunition so your bunkers were full and and that, so if you didn't do a lot of shooting, why uh, you did have some downtime. They always tried to keep you busy, but uh, in Osho Valley, they B 52'd it before we moved in, and one of the bombs landed right in the middle of a stream and it blew a hole about 20 feet deep. I don't know how big around it was huge, and the, the crater filled up with water. So, and it was about maybe a quarter mile from where we were set up. So they uh, were able to let one or two guys, about one guy per section, we were six guns in our section, they'd let us go down and that was the only chance we'd get to take a bath. Uh, so we'd go down to the crater. Um, we only had the clothes that we were wearing. So we'd go down to the crater, we would jump in and get our, our pants wet because mm -hmm. usually we never wore shirts, we just had war pants <laughs> fatigues. We get them wet, take a bar of soap and soap them up, jump back in, rinse them off, and then uh, we would uh, uh, let them hang to dry and then take your own take your own bath and then put your wet clothes back on. And and I remember one time down there it was three of us down there taking our uh, washing our clothes that morning and. Uh, we started getting hit with artillery fire and we ne usually never got hit with artillery. And uh, all I could think to do was, oh my gosh, I got to get to the, 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 the edge of the crater. And uh, stuff was falling all over us. It was hitting the water and, and we were up tight against the edge. And once it finally stopped, why, 
we took off running back to the battery and uh, it was just like one of those nightmares where you're running but you're not moving. <laughs> it was just like you, you was running as hard as you could but your your feet weren't moving you just couldn't get back there fast enough. But uh, So yeah we would get downtime like that uh, maybe find a stream somewhere or once in a while we'd set up a shower where there would be a five gallon bag with a nozzle on the bottom of it and and uh, you we'd have it set up on a steel post and you would dump your five gallons of water in there and then jump down underneath it and get your shower then but there were days we would go when I first got over there we it was rainy uh, you'd go I think we went well you had to keep your shoes on all the time you can never take your shoes off because you always had to be you slept with your shoes you always had to be ready to go we didn't have our shoes off for I think five weeks um, and it rained and it was muddy and soupy and they were concerned about maybe people having foot problems so yeah so they left us they built a fire and left us uh, a few at a time go up and try to dry our socks off and get our feet dry but you dry them off go right back out and walk in the soup and mud and she was wet again anyway so um, but I remember we were in the uh, probably midsummer or whatever. We went to uh, we was in the, we actually set up in the rear area. I don't know if it was Quantry where it was at, and uh, we actually set up in a battery area that one battery moved out, so we got to move in and j we didn't have to dig in and that. And we actually uh, they set up a volleyball net and in between shooting and that we did get to play volleyball. So we did have some downtime, but. Usually it wasn't too much. There would be days you wouldn't even have time to write letters. You know, you'd just be busy the whole day. So, did you get letters often? Uh, my wife wrote me every day. I wrote my wife every day. Uh, it was my fiance at the time. I wrote my mom and dad once a week. Um, and letters were so sporadic when I first course when I first got over there. The first cab unit just moved north. So. Um, Mail was just a mess. I was there probably for about a good three to four weeks before I got any mail and Dad was upset. They thought I wasn't writing because I was in a top secret mission and I couldn't write them and, and uh, they weren't getting my mail. I don't know why. And But um, finally some days you would get five and six letters in one day. You wouldn't get any mail for a while and all of a sudden you get five and six letters a day. Uh, my fiance and, and mom and dad would send me about packages of cookies and stuff a lot so um, we would get we would get mail yeah we would get I would get I'd get mail uh, but it would just be sporadic hmm. did you uh, reread those letters quite a bit I did I had them in a box and I just got them out a while back and I went through every letter and, and read through them all again just uh, kind of refresh or remember what you know things was because we just kind of forgot about it for a long time so mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you said you did have the opportunity to go on leave you said you went to Hawaii? Yes I went to Hawaii in uh, June uh, of 68 um, Sharon my fiance at the time was able to meet me over there and we had uh, a wonderful time just seeing somebody from home again and spending time there and the hard part was having to leave and go back that was tough and the, the worst part uh, was we loaded up on the plane to come back and we had our goodbyes and uh, and at that time airports were small and, and uh, the, the, people could go up and stand right up at the observation deck and, and watch the plane leave. So we had our goodbyes, we got on a plane, we sat there for how long, the women were all up up on top waving to us. Finally they said, ah, something's wrong with the plane, so we disembarked. So we all get off the plane, go back down while we had our hellos again. and sat there uh, holding hands until they said okay back up on the plane again so we went back up again so now we have to say goodbye again and uh, said our goodbyes again 
and uh, I'm not sure if the the second try we made it or it even took the third try <laughs> until we finally got going. But at that point, you're just ready to go. You just oh, let's just go. This is horrible. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's reliving it all over again. Yeah. Every so seconds. yeah. So uh, yeah. So I was able to go to Hawaii and and see Sharon, my my wife now, and mm -hmm. spend time with them. Um, when you were over there, did you carry anything for? Good luck as far as do you have like a Bible, a cross, anything did you carry with you? My rosary. I, I kept my rosary in my pants pocket the whole time. Uh, as far as a good luck, no. I just live, we just live one day at a time, but I always kept my rosary on me and um, God answered many prayers, uh, a lot of prayers for me from family back home and, and my own. So I felt my rosary was what kept me safe. Do you still have it today? You know, I don't. I don't know whatever happened to it. I'm almost wondering if eventually it did get lost, um, or if I did take it home. I, I don't even, yeah, I don't even, I don't know where it's at. Hmm. Okay. Um, this goes back to your little, or when you guys shoot your, you said the 105s? The 105, yes. How many people does it take to shoot that? You said... You described that. Yeah, there's usually five five to six guys you had, well, yeah, six guys because okay. you had your section chief who would be on the phone uh, getting uh, the orders from uh, the fire direction okay. center. And then you had your gunner who was in charge of, uh, he, they would give you what they called a quadrant and deflection, and the gunner would line the gun up uh, from side to side and the assistant gunner would set the angle of the tube then of the gun so um, they would holler down a, a quadrant and you would set that in your scope and then you had aiming stakes that you used uh, and you would sight the gun off of that and then the deflection would come down and then the assistant gunner would crank the gun up or down and you had a leveling bubble and you had to keep leveling it and then go up and down till you got all bubbles were level. You had a loader who stood inside by right aside of the gun as it recoiled in. So uh, his job was the, the assistant gutter would open the breech block up, the loader would shove the round in, in there and then uh, the assistant gunner would close the breech block and then he had the lanyard in his hand that would actually fire the gun. So you had a, usually you had two humpers that would bring the ammo over uh, if you were out of seven charges. If you were shooting a charge uh, five or six, they would take one or two bags of powder out. It was a section chief's job to look at each one before they cut that charge off of it to make sure that it was the right charge that you were shooting. And then the humper would give it to the, the, the uh, loader and the loader would stand there and wait uh, with the round and as soon as it was shot the assistant gunner would open the breech block up and the canister the shell the gunpowder was in would come out the gunner would flip that off to the side the loader would slam another round in and, and then shoot it shoot that way shoot another one in so wow. there would be times when the infantry was moving into an area for the first time they would have what they call a mad minute and what they did every gun would set up for a different spot on the, the landing zone that they were having and we would shoot as many rounds as we could shoot for two to three minutes and it was time so that it would just as the infantry was going out in their Hueys it would be time so that the rounds the whole area would just be loaded with with shot with, with artillery rounds and then it was time we would stop and as soon as the, the last round hit they would the choppers would land and the, the infantry would get off and there would be times um, of course everybody was trying to the, con, the, the game was to see who could fire them who was good enough to fire the most rounds in your mad minute and there would be times we'd shoot 80 and 90 really? rounds yes I was just gonna ask you, per gun you, oh per gun so uh, yes. You have a good, well-oiled team. It was, yeah, you did, and that was what the, the, wow. the game was, to see who could who could just time everything to load and shoot and load and shoot. And and um, so, yeah, we would have those mad minutes. So then when you get done with that, now you've got 80, 90 rounds of ammunition to 
supply <laughs> back in your bunker. So, uh, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, did you personally receive any injuries or after effects from anything? I never. Oh, I one time I got hit with a piece of shrapnel. Uh, it was just at the end of the fall, so it didn't hurt anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got uh, hearing aids that wear in both ears now, obviously from being in uh, artillery, why it damaged both my ears. So I'm uh, hard of hearing. I am um, dealing with prostate cancer right okay. now because of the Agent Orange. So, I was uh, just going to ask, have you been in, you, had to, you dealt with Agent Orange, anything like mm -hmm. that? So I'm dealing with uh, stage four prostate cancer okay. right now. So. Okay. Um, do you remember the word when you said they said you were going home? Well, you were just looking, knowing your orders were coming down. It, it, being, I left the field the seventh of January, and being it's it was so close to Christmas, word had came down that you know what, maybe they'll let a few guys if go home for Christmas. So my hopes would always be that maybe I'd get orders, maybe I'll be home for Christmas, and and it uh, never came down. But once it got was getting close, why um, I just you know you knew you was getting. Yeah, uh, I think I left like five days prior to flying out, so uh, I left the field. Uh, I knew I'd be getting orders soon, and and uh, I think I uh, I might have had. The orders saying that you know on on the second uh, of January you'll be leaving the field and and when we left we 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 were up no we were in Song B we were down in the south at the time but when you left you, there was nobody to pick you up or do anything they just said you got to be an on K within the next five days so your job or you just when a chopper would come out and land, a Huey or a Chinook, whatever it was, and we'd usually get Hueys would bring food out to us and always coming and going. So you'd walk up to the chopper and ask the, the guy, the gunner, sitting there where they were heading, and you're saying, well, I'm looking to get back to the rear area, so, uh, okay, we're going back there. So you would get on, you just sit on that chopper and go here then I'd say okay now I need to get to the airport so I can fly to on K so then I remember going to the airport uh, who what airport it was I don't know it was a landing strip and I got on a, a C-130 and they were heading back to on K and um, they had all kind of supplies pallets jeeps that in it and I just went in and stood amongst the cargo and and I remember just standing there just looking out the window and they got me to on K um, I needed to get I processed there but I, I think once I got to the landing strip to get to the rear area I had to jump on a convoy I think I was they said we could fly out there was a plane going out in the morning and they said we do have a convoy heading to on K now so if, if you want to jump on the back of a truck so I just jumped on the back of a truck and and I remember sitting there making myself as small as possible so we were heading through the countryside uh, rice paddies villages and very nervous uh, I sat there just shrunk up like a little ball with my M16 just and uh, got there um, I processed I'm trying to think at some point once I got to the convoy I needed to get to the other side of Saigon somehow to that airport so I saw a member of South Vietnamese guy on a motorcycle said I, I can get you through town for two dollars so I guess maybe like an idiot, I just wanted to get there. Why I jumped on the back of his motorcycle with <laughs> my big bag in my shoulder, and he took me through Saigon and got me out to the airport so I could fly back to Cam Ranh Bay. Then, so 
It was, uh, but yeah, once you left, it was up to you to get back to where you needed to go. You you didn't have anything, anybody to pick you they up didn't or pull you out as a whole unit. No, at that time. no, you just you're leaving the field, so you left and you just found whatever means you could to get back there: chopper, plane, convoys. Um, and I remember, yeah, gone there again. I didn't have anything to eat for like a couple of days. Jeez because uh, I was just busy trying to get where I needed to go, but finally made it, so. Was there was there an, ever a time that you thought that you weren't going to make it home? Yeah, um, a lot of times. Uh, there was one part in particular, well, I guess what sticks out in my mind the most the night before I was to leave the field to go back to R&R &R to go to Hawaii, um, it was in the evening and I was um, cleaning up. I was taking a shower and I finally got some clean clothes to put on. And I was I just got done taking my shower and got clean clothes on and we heard mortar tubes popping from below our mountain. and uh mortars started dropping all around us and uh, of course our hooch was on the side of the mountain again and so i ran around all of us ran to the hooch to get in and i ran around the uh, the side and just as i got to the the entrance to it i i reached up to swing myself in there was a guy on each side of me and i heard a mortar round drop right behind us and it blew and the guy on each side of me went down and um, I reached out and got the one and pulled him in and then another one came down and it, it flew all around me. I There again, power of prayer. Uh, and I got the other guy in and um, that was, and I it had that, had I got hurt there, yeah. Uh, my wife would have been in Hawaii waiting on me, and I wouldn't have been there. So, and she would not have got word in time. Um, so there was one I I didn't. I, yeah, I didn't know. But yeah, there were several times um, you would be getting hit with rockets and mortars, and you had to go out and get on the gun to shoot because that was the only way you were going to stop it. So as the rounds were falling, uh, you would wait for FDC, Fire Direction Center, okay. to call down and give you coordinates. And when they said battery adjust, you just you had to get out there. And we would crawl out on our bellies and and um, and just lay low and you know trying to dodge the stuff. But until you started shooting back, it wasn't going to stop. So you just got out there and you, you just hope that you didn't get hit and yeah there was a lot of times you just think well this this I don't know but I made it through. <laughs> wow. Okay. So you remember arriving back in the States? Oh yeah. <laughs> I I remember uh coming back to when we flew back uh yeah i just remember the plane when you flew out the the plane load of guys were you know everybody was rowdy and laughing and mm -hmm. joking because you didn't know what you was going to get into and uh when we, and we flew commercial aircraft so uh when we flew back why well, everybody got on the plane and all you heard was just low talking nobody was you know everybody was happy but you weren't happy until you knew you was out of the way and I just remember the plane taking off and once it lifted off the ground the whole plane just erupted in cheers but you didn't feel good until you look back and just I remember looking back and looking out and seeing Vietnam did slowly disappear and it wasn't until it was totally out of sight did you feel safe you know that you knew that okay I should I should make it now and uh, I remember flying home, the, waitre the waitresses, the uh, stewardesses came around and said, you guys are so quiet, let's liven up a little bit. But everybody from being there for that year, you just, you were just subdued and you just wasn't like the bunch going that you were when you went over. 
Um, I remember the stewardess throwing pillows at us and saying, "Come on, you guys, lighten up here. Let's, you know, let's have fun." But and you did, but you just you just wanted to be home. And I remember landing when when I left Cameron Bay. It was 112 degrees out. I think. Oh my gosh. You know, there were times it was up to 120. It was it would it would just be sweltering hot. But uh, I remember getting off in, in uh, Washington, and at that time they didn't have the, the, the canopies that come out and met the plane. You just went down your steps. And we just had our short sleeve khaki uniforms on, and I just remember it was 22 degrees when we stepped off the plane. But it felt so good to feel cool air and to take a deep breath and feel cool air going in your lungs again. It, it just. Uh, it was a wonderful feeling, and uh, they took us in, and and we went to Fort Lewis, and we processed. I'm going to guess within a day, we were processed out. They give us all a steak dinner. Uh, we went down to the mess hall, and they they prepared a steak for us, and uh, they said we know you're in a hurry to get home, so they kept everything moving, and. Um, went down and I think the, about the same day we arrived, I'm thinking that by that night why we were, I was on my way home then to Cleveland, flying into Cleveland Airport then. So it's pretty much as soon as you left Vietnam you were done? Yes, um, as far as... Military wise? No, I still had time to serve yet. Did you? Though. Yeah, I okay. still had um, whew, uh, about seven months, seven, eight months to go yet. I could have extended my time. I could have stayed over there another, I think, three months, mm -hmm. so that when I got home, I only had three months to serve. Uh, then they would let you just go home. You didn't have to go back. But I just wanted to get out and everything. And I was glad I'm, I could have made. I could have made the decision probably in October, September, October, November, just to extend. But I decided against it. And when I left. Things were just enough. I was happy with my decision. <laughs> I was glad to glad to get out. So yeah, when I when I got out, why well, I still had to go back to Fort Sill and then okay. finish my time. What did you do back there when you were there? At Fort Sill, well, when I got home, um, I got married. You got married on. I leave. got married on did leave. Did you really? She, she planned the wedding. <laughs> uh, yeah, when when I was over there, uh, we decided let's get married because I said I'm not gonna say goodbye anymore. So, on well, my 30 days while I was home, uh, we got married. We went on a quick honeymoon to Washington <laughs> D.C. and come back. And so her and I headed out to Oklahoma, just a couple little oh, farm kids you that with you? on our way starting a new life. And so she went with me to Fort Sill. Uh, out there, our, our mission, we just pretty much passing our time. Yeah. Um, my ears had been damaged at that point enough where I talked to the doctor about um, not being out on the guns to shoot anymore because my ears were damaged enough. So they put me in what they call the um, communication center and what we, uh, Sergeant and I would go out and we would lay landlines so that when the, the, we, they would practice shooting, they, there was a telephone wire gone from where the gun was at mm -hmm. to where the forward observers were at. So sometimes you'd lay seven and eight miles of wire to, so that they could oh, hook geez. that phone and to, to the forward observer. So the sergeant and I would go out each day and we would lay land wires. We just had them laying all over the place. And then when they were done with that mission, we'd have to go pick them up and get ready for when they were shooting over here. So it was basically we was doing that and um, shooting probably for the people that were taking training as forward observers and that. I w reported back in first part of is in February um, and I was to get out in August. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, living on a farm, um, I heard where there was a, you could get a 90 day drop, a deferment, if you were in an, what they called an occupational uh, job. Mm -hmm. Being on the farm, may be in a busy time on the farm, and I had farmed with my dad uh, when I as I went into service. 
Um, I applied for it since it was the time it would be I'd be needed at home to milk the cows and, and um, plant crops and get everything in. So I applied for it, and I remember our, my first sergeant laughing at me and saying, "I never heard of such a dumb thing." And, but he said, "I never heard of such a dumb thing," and he says, "You'll never get that." And so I had 93 days left. And I thought, well, I guess that never went through. And I remember standing formation that morning. And when I got done with formation, they said, Holman, we need you up here at the, in the office. And I thought, oh, no, no, what did I do? <laughs> and I walked in, and uh, I remember the, comp the battery clerk said, you're the luckiest guy. He said, you got three days to process and get out of here. So at 93 days, I found out I had three days left, so I was one happy oh camper. So I got, I did get out, and it was about the 25th, 6th, something of May then, so I did get 90 days, I did get out 90 days early. So I was really happy about that. Oh my gosh, so, that is lucky. Yeah, I That's was. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, do you remember when you got home permanently? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, I, my wife and I took a little ex trip while we were out in Oklahoma. We went down to uh, Texas and, and uh, did a little touring down there for about two or three days. I had a friend of mine I was in Vietnam with was in Texas, so, and he got married also. And uh, so we went down and visited him and his wife, and then we took off for a few days through Texas, and then we came home. And yeah, I just remember uh thinking wow it's you know finally done although we did have to be in the national guard we was like uh considered standby status for i'm thinking was four it, years I'd yeah say three or four years so i remember yeah. looking on my dad's discharge papers and mm -hmm. he was in reserve for like three or four years. reserves not national guard yeah, reserve, reserve yeah for... reserve status yes okay it was like a six-year thing yeah. two years active and three year or four years reserve yeah, exactly so um and the word had come down that you know every year you're going to have to do like a six weeks uh, uh basic training type thing and the first year come down, I had orders to go, and I, you know, I had a child at the time, and, and uh, I thought, oh, this is going to be awful to have to go through uh, six weeks of training. But it never came through, and um, after that, I never heard any more, and at the end of six years, well, I finally got my final discharge in, so then I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> final, final. Yes, yes, it was. After you guys... So you guys came back to Ohio. Mm -hmm. What did you do? You you were already married, so you said you had kids. Mm -hmm. Did you stay with the farm work? I did. I farmed with my dad. Uh, we lived in a, a small apartment above her mom and dad's <laughs> place in Alveda, Ohio, and I would go out to the farm every day. And I farmed in partnership with dad. Then I did that for oh maybe two three years. Uh, the second year uh, in 69, uh, the fall of that 69, we did end up buying a farm just down from my dad. So my wife and I uh, moved out onto the farm and then I farmed with dad for a couple years and finally he sold the cows and I didn't want to milk anymore so I got a job in town. I worked at the GE plant in Tiffin for a while and that closed and then I ended up uh, going to work at the post office in Tiffin. And I retired from there then. So, and I just retired from farming here wow. two years ago. So, geez, oh, Pete. Yeah. So, how many kids did you have? We have three children: oh. Scott, Jenny, and Corey. And we have ten grandchildren. <gasps> and mm. they, the whole family. I'm such a lucky guy. And I have such a wonderful wife, Sharon, and kids and grandkids, and they're the apple of my eye. I can tell. <laughs> yeah, oh. very, very proud of them. Very lucky guy. That's nice. Looking back at your experience, would you do it again? <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> uh, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, I got to admit, I, it was not what I wanted to do. I did it because I had to do it. I'm proud that I did it. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, 
it was to me uh, Vietnam was the last year of my life um, the service was a good experience you do learn discipline you do learn to Oh, you meet a ton of people. There are so many characters out there, and um, that was a good experience. Um, it was just something that I knew I had to go through and, and go through it, and, and uh, just took a day at a time. Um, but um, yeah, Vietnam. I'm. I was just. I was so glad that was that was done, and um, I was really happy to get back. But that was a lost year of my life. Yeah. Do you think about it often? I do. Um, it, the funny part is I don't have uh, nightmares, uh, flashbacks of being over there. Mm -hmm. I have my worst nightmare is that I have to go back. Um, I don't know why. That's a nightmare that you have? That's a nightmare that I have that I'm dreaming I have to go back and I don't know why I have to go back. I don't want to go back. And I feel wholeheartedly for the poor guys from Iraq uh, that have to, today that have to go back three and four times. I, I honestly, God, don't know how they do it. I give them all the credit in the world for being able to do that because that is my nightmare of, that I have to go back and and uh, wow. it just wasn't pleasant. <laughs> hmm. Do you still keep in contact with anybody that you surfed with? One guy, um, he lives in uh, uh, Gastonia, uh, North Carolina. That was the ones we visited uh, when we went to Texas. Aww. And probably over the 45 years since I've been out, we've maybe visited him three times maybe. Uh, we don't. Once in a while, Christmas time, he'll call. Mm -hmm. um, we'll send cards to each other. That's been the only guy. Uh, there were three of us that were just just as close as we were brothers. And uh, the other guy, George Pita, he's I don't know where he's at. He's uh, might be in another country with his company, whatever he's doing. Um, and one of what was weird when I first got out to the field. Um, everybody would say, where are you from in the world? Well, the world was considered the United States. So they'd say, well, where are you from in the world? And I said, well, I'm from Ohio. Well, we're in Ohio. I said, well, little town of New Rigo. And they'd say, ah, oh, do you know where Fostoria is at? And I said, oh my gosh, yes. They said, well, our medic is from Fostoria. So I said, where is he? And, uh, so um, Bob Gearing, I uh, was able to, uh, him and I spent a lot of time talking together, but he left about three or four months, <laughs> his time was up. Okay. So didn't get to spend a lot of time with him. And after I got back, I saw him at a few ball games, but um, I haven't had contact mm -hmm. with him since then. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was neat having somebody from that close that to close. home, right in your battery. Wow. You belong to any military organizations when you got back? VFW, American Legion. I'm in the DAV. No. Um, I never did. Uh, uh, I never did join any organizations. My life just seemed so busy, and with uh, farming and to go to meetings, I just no. I never, never joined any. I should, uh, but I just never did with the uh, busy life I had. Mm -hmm. Why? I never did. The DAV is about. The only thing, and that's basically, you know, I got in that they helped me through um, with what I'm dealing with, with the cancer mm -hmm. and the hearing. Uh, the VA has been uh, taking care of me on that, so they've, they've been doing a good job with it. Okay. When you got back, did you find it hard to assimilate back into regular life? Not really. Um, it was, the hard part was after being so hot and getting back in January, it was it was so cold. But, yeah. uh, but then we ended up going out to Fort Sill, which was uh, wasn't that cold out there. It wasn't mm -hmm. you know snow on the ground. As far as mixing in with people, no. Mm -hmm. um, I had wonderful family, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. Uh, 
Uh, no, I did not have any problems with dealing with the past or anything like that. I was always good that way. Good. That's good to hear. Well, anything that we didn't cover that you wanna you wanna add? Uh, probably not. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot of I probably babbled on a lot, no, no, but you uh, did. amazing. It was. Uh, I say it was. It was quite an experience. I felt fortunate being in artillery and not the, what the infantry put up with those guys those guys put up with a lot and uh, I was just fortunate to uh, to be up on the mountaintops and, and the infantry around us to, uh, uh, we didn't have to be down in the jungles and that we worked hard but uh, at least we weren't down humping in the jungles um, I do remember one thing when you asked if I, if I was uh, ever felt like this was it, um, right after we got over there, I, we moved up to on K, and nothing was established yet. Everything was a mess. They didn't have uh, a building set up or anything. And so when I got up to on K, this is when I was first in country. They said, "Well, we don't have a place for you. You're going to have to spend time with the Marines. You're going to have to sleep with the Marines." So I remember going to the Marine headquarters and saying, I guess I'm supposed to stay with you guys until we get established. So he goes, okay, if you're going to stay with us, you're going to pull guard with us. So I said, okay. So he said, after supper, after chow time tonight, uh, he said, you go out. And we were by an Arab strip and there was what they called blibbits and they were full of gasoline and they were flat they looked about like um, a pillow a flat huge flat pillow they held thousands of gallons of aviation fuel and that for the airplanes and there were I'm thinking four at least four of these blibbits full of aviation fuel and they said your job tonight is to go out and pull guard duty out there and here's a shovel and sandbags you dig your foxhole and you go out and you pull guard duty tonight so another guy and i took the sandbags and our rifle and the shovel and we set up right dead center we had to set up right in the middle i just remember pathways between these four and we had to set up an air in case we'd get overrun we spent how long digging our hole, um, putting sandbags around it, and then we would take turns. And all you could do is just squat down and just enough room to, to set in a haunch position and sleep. Well, that first night, um, I'm thinking it was about the beginning of the Tet Offensive, um, a lot of rockets started going off. And they were coming in, I, I don't, they were trying to hit the airport. And all I remember is my first experience with hearing rockets, and they were screaming right over top of our heads. And all I could think of was, if it hits one of those blibbits of fuel, they won't even find me. <laughs> it was, so uh, that was an experience. I got my eyes open right after being there. Um, but yeah, rockets were just screaming, just missing us and hitting the airport, right? They're trying to blow up. And they did hit some planes in the landing strip and helicopters and and uh, they did quite a bit of damage. But that was pretty much the beginning. It was right at the beginning of the Tet Offensive. Everything just broke out like that. But we did that for about two or three nights. And then finally, why uh, we got our headquarters established where I was able to go to where the 1st Cav Division was at and, and then that's where I started my job humping ammo or, or uh, uh, after that then but uh, yeah I just happened to think about that <laughs> just thinking they'll never find anything of me if they, they hit one of those. So no. yeah. That was a very frightening scary experience. Um, you didn't get much sleep at night but um, but yeah I, I did happen to think of that. Wow. <laughs> I can't Hmm. All right. Well, anything else? I think that's got it, Julie. All I right. Guess All right. that's. Okay. One other thing um, that I thought of, I would like to add to um, the Vietnam War was an unpopular war. Nobody uh, 
seem to like it. Um, while we were over there, you felt like there was no support from home, uh, that, that everybody was, was against it. At Christmas time, uh, Bob Hope came over with his Christmas show, and uh, they chose two people from our battery to go to Long Bend to see his show. Um, I was one of the lucky ones that did get down to see it, and what a morale booster to know that as unpopular and, and unfavorable as everything was that he would uh, come over with his group of people and uh, put on a show like that for us. Um, it was him, uh, I remember Ann Margaret, the Gold Diggers, I think Miss World, there was oh, quite a entourage he had, but there must have been, I'm gonna guess, eight to 10,000 people in a big bowl area <laughs> setting, uh, all in a just like a big bowl with a stage in the center. And um, he would come out and just to see Americans again, uh, it was just it was just a phenomenal experience. The the performance was just wonderful, um, and it was just good to know that somebody from home cared enough to come over and and do that. Um, it was it was good. And right at the end, um, I'm not sure who sang it, but. They sang uh, Silent Night was the last song they sang. And as I looked around, everybody's head was either hanging down or they were wiping tears from my eyes and me included. It was just, it was just, uh, it was phenomenal. I only had two or three weeks of time left in the field yet before I was to come home. So I was always so thankful that I was just a short timer and, and I could go home after that because that really made you want to go back home. Um, but yeah, but it was great. When we got back, we had um, to finish my time. I went back to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and we had to take uh, riot control training because of the protest and, and everybody uh, uh, protesting against the war. And we had a practice, uh, we had our rifles with us, with no ammunition of course, and then we had our bayonets that were covered up. And we had to practice uh, standing in formation and doing crowd control where they would come up and throw garbage in your face and spit on you. And you was to stand there and, and, and take it motionless and, and expressionless. and. Um, we were called up on standby when I was in Fort Sill in 69 to uh, possibly go out and do crowd control, but uh, thank God we never got called. I was always thankful that I did not have to go out and help do that, because that, that would have been hard coming back from over there doing that. But um, the two years were, were an experience. Um, I'm proud to have served my country. I'm proud to have done uh, my duty that was asked of me back then. Uh, I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, I'm proud that I did what I did. And all I can say is God bless all veterans, young and old alike, and may God bless America.